Hey everybody, welcome to a bonus edition of the Catholic Bible Study. We have a, a Holy Day of Obligation coming up on November 1st, this coming Wednesday. And for us as Catholic Christians, this is a Holy Day of Obligation, a day we're expected to go to Mass, and not only go to Mass, but actually, as much as we can, treat it like we would treat a Sunday. So if, if you're able at all on November 1st, don't go to work. Take the day off if you're able to. Uh, and I, I know this is kind of tricky because we, we live in a, a culture that is not really Christian anymore. And so there maybe was a time when it was very common for people to take the day off from school or to, to for school just to be canceled or for businesses to be closed. And so people didn't have to worry about, gosh, do I take a day, day of vacation or something, whatever. And, and so we don't really live in that world anymore. So now for a person to celebrate these holy days of obligation as though they're Sundays, well, that, that can be a little tricky sometimes. So anyway, um, it's, it's encouragement for you. And if you have to go to work, okay, you have to go to work. But for the rest of the day, try to treat it like you would a Sunday, a day of rest, a day of worship, of course, uh, but reju rejuvenation where we can celebrate in God's goodness. The purpose of that day is, is to celebrate God's goodness for all of us, in fact. So we know that throughout the, the year, we have different saints that we celebrate on particular days. You know, St. Francis of Assisi on October 4th, or St. Lucy on December 13th, um, or St. Therese of Lisieux on October 1st. You know, different different saints that we celebrate. Uh, but what we don't, what, what we're doing on today is we're celebrating all of those saints who don't have a particular feast day. Maybe because we don't really know for sure that they're in heaven. But the Lord knows for sure that they're in heaven because they're there worshiping him. We're going to see this, this image in our first reading. A day for us to rejoice that the Lord's call for holiness is for all of us. Whether we end up being publicly recognized by the church or privately recognized by the Lord, obviously the most important thing here is to be privately recognized by the Lord, where we hear, hear at the end of our lives, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Whew, man, those are the words that we all want to hear. And that's, we're celebrating those people today that, that heard those words upon their death, upon their judgment by the Lord. Um, rejoice, rejoice. What a gift. Okay, let's let's start with our prayer, and then um, we'll jump into our first reading. We have all, we have three readings, just like we would on a, a Sunday, and so we'll, we'll have three videos for All Saints Day, and um, we'll just rejoice in the Lord's goodness. Okay, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty ever-living God, by whose gift we venerate in one celebration the merits of all the saints, Bestow on us, we pray, through the prayers of so many, so many intercessors, an abundance of the reconciliation with you, for which we earnestly long. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, man, that's so good. That's so good. Okay, so we're celebrating the merits. We're venerating, venerating. We're showing great honor and respect for the merits of all the saints. The merits. What does that mean? It means that when we're saved by the Lord, when we're brought into a place of what we call righteousness or justification, this is a free gift that the Lord comes to give us, to grant us salvation. But then we cooperate with his grace by remaining in that place of justification, that, that place of righteousness. Um, we, we cooperate by receiving his grace and by letting that grace become active in us. St. Paul says, don't receive the grace of God in vain. In other words, don't let it go to waste in your life. And so we want to receive the grace of God and we don't want it to go to waste. But instead, we want to cooperate with it so that we can actually grow in holiness. We can expand the capacity of our soul to receive the fullness of God. That's, that's, that's a gift. <laughs> that is a gift. The Lord comes to dwell within us. But, but the more we allow ourselves to be worked upon by God's grace, and as we work upon ourselves with God's grace, what happens? Our soul expands and we can receive more and more of the fullness of God, which is just a, a really incredible, incredible thing that the Lord can expand his kingdom, not only in the world, but his, he can expand his kingdom even in my heart and my soul and in yours as well. So we're, we're, we're venerating that. We're, we're looking at the example of, of all the saints throughout history, all the holy men and women throughout history. Whether we knew them personally or whether we didn't know them, we maybe hear their story, something like that. We, we venerate that and we just say, whoa, you lived a life that is, that is worth celebrating, that is worth honoring because you were focused on the one thing necessary, which is sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning from him, meditating on his law day and night. That, that's it. So we, so, so we celebrate. And as we do that, we ask him to bestow on us through their intercession, through their prayers. We, we know this, that in the book of Revelation, it, it talks about how there's smoke that rises, which is uh, the, the prayers of the saints, the prayers of the holy ones. So through their prayers, we ask the Lord to bestow on us an abundance of reconciliation with him, with the Lord, because we long for that. We long to be united with God. Because of, because of sin, our union with God is broken. That, that the union is, is shattered. Jesus comes to restore that union 
And, and then because of our sin, our, our mortal sin, we break that union over and over and over again if we commit mortal sins over and over and over again. And, and, and even our, our little sins, our, our venial sins, we can, we can cause damage in that relationship. And so we just ask the Lord to reconcile us, to, to, by His grace, to bring it about that we can be brought back into a perfect union with Him as much as possible. Whew, man, that's so good. Okay, our first reading. The book of Revelation, chapter 7, verses 2 and two through 4, and then we jump to verses 9 through 14. So we, we skip a chunk because it's just a list of, you know, like, okay, 12,000 came from this tribe and 12 from this tribe, and so we just skip all of that because um, we just do. Okay, so anyway, so let's get into it. Revelation 7, verses 2 through 4, and then 9 through 14. I, John, saw another angel come up from the east, holding the seal of the living God. He cried out in a loud voice, to the four angels who were given power to damage the land and the sea. Do not damage the land or the sea or the trees until we put the seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. I heard the number of those who had been marked with the seal, 144,000 marked from every tribe of the children of Israel. After this, I had a vision of a great multitude which no one could count from every nation, race, people, and tongue. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, Salvation comes from our God, who is seated on the throne and from the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They prostrated themselves before the throne, worshipped God, and exclaimed, Amen. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor, power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders spoke up and said to me, Who are these wearing white robes, and where did they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you are the one who knows. He said to me, These are the ones who have survived the time of great distress. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Oh man, this is incredible. Okay, so the book of Revelation, I know, uh, in fact, I, I, you could go back a year ago and I made videos for, for these readings, so they're probably going to be pretty similar to each other. Um, anyway, within the book of Revelation, we know that John, at the beginning, he actually talks about how he's, he's caught up in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. That something happens where he's given this incredible vision of heaven. So he's transported into the, the kingdom of heaven where, where he gets a chance to see things. In fact, there's, I think in, in chapter 4 it begins by saying, I looked and lo, an open door. And it's just like, oh man, you got to peek inside and see what's going on in, inside heaven. Like what's going on? And he sees these visions and all these different things going on. So that's what's going on in the book of Revelation. So when it says, I saw another angel come up from the east holding the seal of the living God, he's saying like, okay, this is what I saw in my vision at least in this part. So the book of Revelation, I think, is 22 or 21 chapters long. So anyway, so it's, 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 a good, um, it's a good amount of reading. And some of it can be a little confusing, but just to understand, like, he's getting a vision of the kingdom um, as it is, as it is before him. Incredible. So anyway, so he sees an angel come from the east. So the east, what, what is the east? The east is um, to be considered, like, where, where paradise was. So it's, it's where paradise was, or it's, it's where Jesus is going to come from. Um, in fact, there's, there's a tradition uh, among the the mass, when we offer the mass, there's a tradition that, that oftentimes the priest would face the east. It's called ad orient, ad, ad orientum, celebrating the mass ad orientum, facing the east because we're looking for, for the Lord to come and we're worshiping the Lord in the east. So it's the, this, this direction is not an arbitrary sort of random direction that's given, but it's a direction that points to the Lord. It points to paradise. So I saw an angel come from the east holding what? Holding the seal of the living God. What's, what's a seal? So we, we don't do this much in our day and age, but it, it used to be the case, and it st still sometimes is the case, that when you send a letter to someone, because you don't want anyone else to read it, or you don't want, uh, or, or more, more importantly, you want the person who receives it to know that it's from you, you would have a seal that, that you would like press down onto some wax, and that seal was, it, it had an engravement in it, so that when the person received the letter, they, they could know like, oh, this comes from you. This comes from this person. So the seal of the living God uh, is, is, of course, when whoever's engraved with the mark of the seal is going to be marked as a member, someone who belongs to God, who comes from God and who belongs to God. So this, this angel cried in a loud voice to the four angels who were giving power to damage the land and the sea. So these four angels, uh, in fact, if you look at the, the uh, chapter 6, there's this kind of a, a continuous thing going on where John has this vision of these, these creatures. So these seals are unlocked. And then when the seals are unlocked, at four different of the seals, there are these creatures that are, are given a particular kind of power to prowl about or to roam around the world and cause some distress. 
In fact, so it's talking about how there's there's like distress, there's there's uh, affliction coming for all of God's people or for all of the people on earth. And and what he's saying is like, wait, don't damage the land or the sea until we put the seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. In other words, we 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 still have to mark on the forehead those who belong to God, so that so that when the destruction comes, it's not a matter that it's not like they're going to escape the destruction necessarily, but but they'll escape it in the long run. Uh, when the destruction comes, the Lord can know, like, this one belongs to me, and so I will take him to myself. This one belongs to me, and so I will take her to myself. That, that, so, so hold on. Don't, don't bring about the affliction. Don't bring about the, the, the destruction until we have time to mark those who the Lord knows he wants to be with him. And then what? So how many is it? Well, I heard the number of those who had been marked on the seal, 144,000 marked from every tribe, of the children of Israel. So this is a symbolic number, as, as I understand it. So some, sometimes you'll, you'll see people say like, oh, this is the number of people that, that's in heaven. And, and it's re that's not really the case. So how many tribes of Israel are there? There are 12. Uh, 12 squared, just because it's worthwhile to, to square the number, 12 squared is 144 times 1,000, just to make it a bigger number, is 144,000. So it's, it's basically showing like, okay, God's people are, are, are his privileged people. And so here, here the Lord is he's, he's showing the privilege to them by saying that there's going to be a large amount of people in heaven. Of course, not everybody is in heaven. The Bible is really clear about that. But there's going to be a large amount of people in heaven. And the, the first people mentioned are the people who are of Israel. And we know that the Lord Jesus, when he comes, he calls 12 apostles because he's come to establish a new Israel. And so, like, the Lord has a particular call on the people of Israel. But then it gets, it gets better. After this, I had a vision of a great multitude which no one could count from every nation, race, people, and tongue. This is the thing. We know the gospel. It's, it's not only for the Israelites. It's not only for the Jewish people. In fact, some Jewish people reject it. And so what we see in the gospels, and especially in the Acts of the Apostles, really where we see it, is Paul, on his preaching journey, when, when he preaches to the Jewish people, those who accept it, of course, they join him and they're excited about it. But those who reject him, well, they reject him. And so Paul says, fine, if you reject the gospel, I will turn to the Gentiles. I will turn to the non-Jewish people so that they, they can have an opportunity to receive the good news of the gospel. And we find out that Paul preaches to them, and they have conversions. And many non-Jewish people come to worship the Lord. In fact, probably a lot of people watching this video come from non-Jewish ethnicities. And, and like that's, that's a gift that the Lord, his salvation is, it is for the Jewish people, provided they believe in the, son, the Lord Jesus. But it's also for the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, provided we believe in the Lord Jesus. And, and the, the, the result is like, what? There's a great multitude in heaven of people who are, who are of Jewish origin and people who are not of Jewish origin, a great multitude, which, which, what? No one could count. And they come from every nation, every race, every people and tongue. These are the people that we're celebrating on All Saints Day. Like this, this incredible gift that, that we're celebrating. And, and what are they doing? They're standing before the throne, before the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus. Jesus is called the Lamb of God. They, they stand before his throne. They're wearing white robes and holding palm branches. These are symbols of joy and victory. They, they ran the race. They, they persevered in the faith, in, in their lives, worshiping the Lord and giving him honor and glory. And so they, they rejoice. And as they stand around the throne, they cry in a loud voice, a loud voice. Salvation comes from our God who is seated on the throne and from the Lamb. You have, to, you have to imagine, you know, like sometimes we watch, watch sports on TV or you go to like music concerts and there's like thousands of people there. And they're all just like... It's, Kind of, kind of worshiping the people on the field or on the stage, you know, whatever. Maybe, maybe not always worshiping them, but, but you, know, you, get the, you get the idea. They're cheering loudly for these people. Now imagine that same scene with, with more people, like multitude of people, and they're all crying out with one voice at, at one time. Salvation is from, the, from our God who is seated on the throne and from the Lamb. Like they're all just rejoicing of like, we're all here for one reason. And that one reason is because we've been saved by the Lamb who was sent by the Father. Whew, man, this, this is incredible. Like, all Saints Day is a day that's worth celebrating for you and for me because we hope to be a part of that crowd. We can actually even begin to be in that crowd, even here and even now, as we rejoice in our God. We too can come before the Lord and worship Him. And, and as we do this, it leads us to this deeper longing of like, oh man, I can't wait for that day. I can't wait for that day. And then as, as it continues, all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They prostrated themselves before the throne and worshiped God and exclaimed, Amen. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor, power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. What do you do in heaven? You worship God around the throne. You shout his praises. You exclaim his glory before, before everyone else who is also exclaiming his glory, who is also worshiping him. And then what? Then one of the elders said, okay, well, who, who are these people? What are they doing? And the guy's like, okay, I, you're the one who's going to know. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a visitor. I'm just a guest who, who gets to, to see this. Well, okay, well, these are the ones 
who have survived the time of great distress. In other words, they persevered. They, it's not that they escaped it. They survived it. They persevered through it, being faithful to the Lamb. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is, this is like one of those images that doesn't really make sense. They, they washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, which is, of course, red, and yet their robes have turned out white. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin and wipes away all stain of sin so that we can be pure before the Lord and clean before him. This is, this is an incredible reading. And then our psalm, it, it's just so beautifully follows up after it. Uh, from Psalm 24, Lord, this is the people that longs to see your face. Right? So as, as we hear readings like this, as we meditate upon them and reflect on them and, and maybe hear some, some teaching about them, what does it make us do? Hopefully, hopefully it makes us just think like, oh man, I want that so bad. I want that so bad. I long to see the face of the Lord. And then this, this beautiful psalm, as I understand it, it's a psalm that, that they would have sung as they were entering into the temple, the place where God dwells. And so it's just like, we long to see your face. And so they're, they're singing this song. They're chanting this psalm. And you can imagine like, so this, this sort of back and forth with the choir where it says, who can ascend the mountain of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? And then the other side of the choir says, one whose hands are sinless, whose heart is clean, who desires not what is vain. Right? So this sort of back and forth, like they're asking the question, they're giving the answer. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord, a reward from the God, his Savior. And then such is the race that seeks him, that seeks the face of the God of Jacob. Who is it that seeks the face of the God of Jacob? Ultimately, it's those whose hands are sinless and whose heart is clean, who desires not what is vain. So we ask the Lord to purify our hearts, that we may not desire those, those passing things of this world, but instead we would only desire to see him and him alone. Man. Gosh, this is so good. This is so good. Thanks for joining me for this bo bonus Bible study. Uh, we got a couple more videos coming up, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm excited to share them with you. Okay, God bless you.